lot of a lot of times it's very scoped to to a problems to certain problems or like niche niche solutions. But in general, it can be separated into this again. It's not in the talk at least. I kind of named uh, important steps that, that I see that is that it starts from some some data collection. So we need to to gather the data from all the devices around us, from all the signals, collect them uh, and store them. That's the, the first step. We kind of you know big data here. Uh, we, we've been through this already. So uh, then we need to prepare the data for the for our consumption. So if we need to aggregate or join our some tables, or you know if it's images or geospatial data that needs to be converted in some format, um, then we have to do some feature engineering. Whoever does machine learning or in the machine learning field would know that feature engineering uh, varies a lot from problem to a problem, and it's actually pretty much like black magic. You, you don't really know what works. You do a bunch of experiments. So think about this moment as you've got a fork in time, right? So depending on what feature engineering this kind of define your path. After that, you also have to fork on your feature selection, so, right? We need to apply some algorithms to select some of the features. Are they good or bad? Would they give some predictive power to your you know, model and so forth. Then you have to sample through this, again, random sample or non-random sample and so forth. Then we drill down to algorithm implementation, which, you know, it's like a favorite probably topic in academia, what kind of cool stuff we can do. Again, it's not, it's not the only thing that we have to solve when we actually do machine learning. Uh, then for those algorithms, we actually want to also enumerate through the, through the different parameters that algorithms have. And uh, we need to iterate through them and determine which work the best, depending on the model, depending on the data, uh, which is also a non-trivial problem. You can do probably you can do an exhaustive search. It's very expensive, so you're trying to, to have some like a smart way of uh, optimizing on that as well. And then we go to the model selection, the model serving. Right, there's another set of problems that are pretty complex. Uh, how do we actually select the, the, the models that work? And then model serving is, you know, it's actually the, the probably the cherry on the on the pie here. It's like, okay, we have the model, and now we want to serve it. Maybe you know, it's on a mobile device. Or maybe it's on the, it's on some, um, it's on a data center as a web service or whatever. And one last thing, it's actually very important, not necessarily the you know, last one. I'm just like on the order of processing. So model prediction insights. When customers come over and ask, why do I get such a score for model? Why why my model doesn't give doesn't give me a good prediction or it says certain certain decision of tasks should or should not be done, this is where prediction insight come in. If you kinda think about um, as if you do a search in Google, right, have this little highlight that shows why the result came up. Well, they don't do it much anymore. You know, you see a lot of promoted things. And then metrics, of course, because you want to be measuring yourself. Um, so, in general, you can shorten this list a little bit, and just like in this like a loop, your daily loop, or you know, um, that's what machine learning engineers and data scientists do. We kind of first define product requirements. When we when we step into the problems, um, we start by again collecting the data, maybe like some A/B tests and so forth, exploring for some notebooks, um, define our hypothesis, whether we want to prove or disprove. Will this increase the KPI or decrease the KPI? Will this improve the churn of users? Oh, sorry, increase the churn of users or, or not? Um, we do some data preparation and then we build prototype verify hypothesis and train and deploy. And then this can actually, you know, we can loop through this multiple times. So now keep this in your heads, right, when you think about building machine learning, right? And now for Salesforce, the use case is, is orders of magnitude more, more complicated. Because we, we're a large platform and we not necessarily have, you know, petabytes of data but we have a, a vast diversity of use cases. So we'll come back, just put some logos here. So we have, for example, American Red Cross, this is a one-profit organization uh, that does a bunch of com campaigns to raise money, not only, but uh, you know, just to, to alert community about certain events. So they have one, one set of problems for their machine learning. Uh, 
scenarios. And then US bank might have a different set of problems, or well, what might definitely, right? How to offer your best credit line, how to you know optimize on your bank account and so forth, your expenses. Maybe they can do some characteristic of statistics by, by states and uh, be smart about reaching their customers. And uh, also the, the consumer facing companies. Um, you know, such as uh, maybe like L'Oreal, where they have, you know, fashion campaigns or things like that, beauty lines, where you know, they need to do different, very different set of problems on, on every single Salesforce cloud. Um, so to, to cope with all that, we needed to have, you know, some, some capabilities, um, hopefully shared capabilities to, to support all this kind of all this diverse number of problems. So here's a very short okay, survey. How long uh, you know, does it take to build a machine learning application? What do you think? You know, just like give a number, you know, from so is it hours? I don't see many. So maybe like days? Days? Okay, days one and then weeks. Okay, we have a little bit more months. Months and then probably the rest is even the more or just don't vote, which I'm mean, too shy to say, I guess. Um, and this should hint you what the answer is. So this little image, not my image, it's like, you know, it's a NASA. It's an image of, uh, infrared image of a black hole. Um, so it kind of should hint you in general. Hmm? We, we can discuss that later. I took it from their blog post, so. Uh, um, anyways, depending on the product requirements, it, it's yeah. really an exhaustive process of, you know, to build a machine learning tool, application. Like, when I mean application, something that is production ready, application that you can, you know, do billions and, you know, and trillions of predictions. Yeah. So here's an example from Salesforce again. This is our, one of our products that we present at Last Greenforce. And, um, uh, this is called Einstein Prediction Builder, which in summary can be summarized in very like a point click predict. And this was the, the mantra of the product where, where the user will come over and would say, okay, we would like to predict certain field in our data store. And uh, they would like to select some set of fields and do click, 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 and then some magic should happen on the back end. Right, the, get, the data should be gathered, processed, prepared, joined, machine learning application should be built, you know, various models should be compared head to head, and then eventually, either really fast, we should deliver some scores to customers. This is a tough problem. And I, I come from engineering, so for me it was literally this question, like, really, do we really want to do this? Because it's like, again, one part is like the, the actual application, another thing is also the trust part. So how do we make it secure? How do we make sure you know, we comply with GDPR? These are all, all questions that we, we had to solve through this, uh, through this journey. So, well, we took this task, right? And then we were like, went to the whiteboard and started asking maybe there's like a magical formula that can give us a good way of taking the, the, the time that it takes to build machine applications from you know months or years and, and squeeze it into hours. Can we at least build prototypes? Like really um, prove or disprove our ideas faster. Can customers literally do click, 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 get some model out there? You know, it might not be uh, very accurate. It might give you 90% accuracy or 85% accuracy. Uh, but we can at least explain it, and then customers might decide if they want to go and fine-tune it. Or, or not, or just completely drop the idea, maybe it's not worth it. But the, the prototyping part was was not only important for internal teams, but now it came, it came and became important for the Salesforce global, global use case across all the clouds, across, the, across all the customers. So another quote that I liked a lot from Grady Butch, is he's a, he's a designer of XML, you know, he said that the task of software development team is to engineer the illusion of simplicity. And we obviously, yes, we cannot make, make things simpler. We can just make them look simpler. 
and then you kind of give a, a different way of looking at things for people so they can then operate on a high level of, uh, they can embrace a higher level of thinking, right? It's like a mathematical formulas. You just you can suddenly express very complex things in just a few symbols. So very similar thing here. So it actually boils down to you know giving some layer of abstraction. So we would like to on one hand we have this complexity complex problem, and on the other hand we have the some abstraction layer that we want to build to to hide some of the complexity but still not to move too much freedom. And I just like to put some images here. You know, from very detailed, you know, it's a Russian painter, um, to, to more details. And then, for example, on the last image where we see the Malevich quadrat, quadrat it's, it's like no obvious what we can do, it's literally a black box. So we don't want machine learning to look like a black box. We maybe want to look like something like a Picasso painting, where yeah. you can still understand that here, there's a happy man, he's flying to the skies, and he's probably in love. You don't see the heart, the red heart. Um, like on the left is like a red, red dot. So, um, so not not too much overwhelming details, right? Because actually, we humans are really bad with a large amount of details. We don't operate on on uh, with data with a lot of a lot of signals. So we want to uh, distill it in some way for and let the machines do the the, the heavy lifting. Um, so. We went and we, we started looking for some appropriate you know, level of abstraction. And level of abstraction more or less defines, you know, defines how, how can you operate on problems. So uh, the lower abstraction, um, sorry, the, uh, I inverted here for the degree of freedom. So let's say if we go and define the language syntax and some semantics of the language. Uh, think of you know, C versus uh, SQL. Okay, so C is a, is a very, you know, uh, low abstraction, high freedom. You can, you can solve much more problems with it, but it's, it's, it's more difficult to, to sometimes express yourself because you, you fall into a lot of details. And with SQL, you can, you know, operate, okay, I'm just doing this table by this key, I'm grouping, I'm just starting temporary table into something else. And you can you can build more more complex CTL. So try to build a CTL in C. You will write thousands and thousands of lines of code, um, not, not solving the issue. So we wanted to find some some middle ground to give our like internal teams um, uh, an ability to operate faster and then build machine learning applications faster. And we all know there are bunch of you know bunch of good and bad frameworks we know Python with pandas and, and scikit and we know R and maybe you know some people do MATLAB and um, you know Spark of course and uh, all of them have like good and bad things and we actually like a lot a lot of things what we've seen we try to uh, to build to build our own library and that's how the transmography was born so as of two weeks ago, this was this was a closed source project. So this is actually the first time I'm giving a talk about this. I was talking about this in general. I wasn't talking about the transmogrify, the open source. So this is a library that we've built for the last couple of years. And this is what it tries to do. It pretty much tries to, to build your machine learning applications fast. It tries to reduce you know, your time. It tries to save this precious time that we have. This is literally the only resource we have. And um, give you a good syntax, good environment for you to, to also evolve this prototype. But most importantly, it's also productionize it. So there's no limit for it. It's not like um, you build a notebook, and now after the notebook, you have you need to spend extra cycles for, the, for some team to productionize it. This is the environment for prototyping. and for productionizing. Um, and of course we had to we had to hide a lot of complexity. And here's just an example of an internal type hierarchy that we had to build to support our machine learning use cases. And uh, whoever works with Salesforce might recognize some of the types. These are 
pretty much the, the standard Salesforce types, such as you know, text area, combo box, and maybe like multi pixels. Those are those Salesforce types, but they're still very generic that match uh, a ton of use cases. You can look on Salesforce how successful the platform was to build a, a ton of applications. You know, we have providers such as Accenture, for example, that build a, a whole business on top of uh, serving their tenants off, off Salesforce schemas. And then we, we kind of took the types and we built our own little hierarchy there to, to have to have machine learning problems um, match and use them uh, easier. For example, let me give you like one example. A binary type here, it extends numeric, right? So in, if you go to a Java type hierarchy or you know, Scala type hierarchy, it's, that's, that's not the case. Right? And for us, binary type is just a numeric type of zero and one. So it made sense to have uh, this hierarchy and so forth. Maybe um, uh, the multi-response, it's actually, you know, the, the, any set, set variable is a multi-response. Multi so you, you will have a multi-class multi -class problem that's work with it. Or um, a location type is a state map. So any map of, with, with state values is just a bunch of locations. It should be treated as a location. So don't try to memorize it, but anyway. It's, it's useful probably for the developers of the library for others. Um, now, we went ahead and also started using those types. You know, there are a bunch of, there is like ongoing, I mean, a uh, bunch of folks who, who have an ongoing kind of fight battle between dynamic, dynamic typing with the static typing and compile languages and compile languages. We are on the compile side, right? We, we actually think that we should make machines work for us as much as they can, as we can, and then if they can check types for us in our programs, they should do so. So we took those types and we put them everywhere. So every every single value operation with uh, with a library happens on, on top of types. And then uh, when we do feature operations, you know, transform transform the data, they're also all typed. And this is like a little snippet of code that somebody can. And it's a fully compilable in, with, with the library. It's, uh, you know, say I want to do tokenize some text, and it would return a text list, so I'll just do t.map, so uh, map operation, apply the map operation uh, on the text value. If, if it's present, I will split it, right, and then convert it to text list. So the next line is I define a feature for my machine learning application. Feature means maybe a column, right? It's a, it's a column in your data where you would say, right, let's say my input data is a book, and I would, take, I would like to take the title of this book, and this will be my predictive feature. It will, it will go and be used for predicting the, let's say, price of the book. Um, and then I can do the same type of operations on, the, on those features as I would do on the value types. So I can do title.map tokenize. I will just use this little function that's just defined to apply on every single cell in that column. So that's useful. Not only it's useful, it's actually working. And uh, you can unit test it and integrate tests and everything. So it has a lot of benefits of um, solving your problems ahead of time rather than after. And whoever around Python notebooks or whatever on, on big data would discover unpleasant surprises of you know, null pointer and, and, and uh, class custom, like custom exceptions that happen several hours after you train the model. During the training, so you know uh, this kind of problems they don't exist for us. Um, then another thing is say that we speak it into the workflow. So workflow is like a you know a set of stages that's been applied on the data before it's been consumed by the machine learning application. So they're also that. Um, so here's a here's a, all the code for example that we need to write to predict the price for a book. Let's say we have a little data set that has uh, that has, how much do I have? I have three predictive columns and one response. So response is something that I want to predict. Right? I want to predict how much the price of the book will be based on the author, title, and the description of the book. Maybe I have a hint and maybe, you know, a, a more detailed description with, with more prescribed uh, explanation of what this book is about will, will, 
will uh, uh, allow me to provide a better price for the book. And uh, I start by defining the features as the first block of code. Then I have to say, for example, I want to do some transformations on the features. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm squashing together title and description as regular variables in the code. I tokenize it with no punctuation, for example. Probably not necessary for my machine learning application. Right? And then I do TF idea, it's a well-known algorithm, right? To get some vector form. And then I run uh, a magical shortcut. I will explain shortly what it means to transmogrify. Uh, then maybe I want to do some safety check on my features, see if the, the features have good predictive power. And then I train the model, right? So I spin up, in this case, Spark context. Um, I read my uh, book CSV file, this is my training set, and then I, I train the model. So after this, you know, how much 16 lines of code here, I get, I get a full, fully fledged model. Um, so here's the magical mm -hmm. part here, right? We have this transmogrify shortcut, and then raw feature filter. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the internals of this, of these things. So book price predictions can be seen as this, and that's pretty much what it looks like for, from the execution point of view. So whenever it runs on Spark, this is what 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 happens. So books is some you know storing the CSV file, maybe you know Spark file doesn't matter. Being materialized, for feature for features being materialized as a as a data frame. Uh, then we apply a raw feature filter that computes distributions of, of all the values in the, in the raw data, and then we apply all the stages that were specified by the user. Uh, what we have there? Oh, yeah. And then we build one large multidimensional vector that is then being consumed by the algorithms. But before we do so, well, after we do so, we immediately apply the same check. We see which, which portions of this vector actually have Good distributions. If they have good distributions, they, they don't, you know, they, maybe they're leakers. They they, they they leak some of the predictive power of, of our models. We remove them, and then we apply, you know, cross validation uh, and the, the model selection, evaluate the results, and and pick up the best model. So this is in the essence what Transmogrify does, and uh, we uh, we focus on three main areas. So we focus on automating feature engineering, features, automating feature selection, and automating the, the model selection. And there are more things that I didn't put, I put here, but I just wanted to focus on those three main areas. Uh, and then for each type, we kind of went ahead and we, we defined a bunch of, bunch of uh, um, predefined set of defaults that we found to be very well performing on, on the large number of data sets that we ran. Uh, and this is what the transmogrify shortcut does for you. So you can take a bunch of raw features, let's say you, you read your data, you extract your email, whatever, say you have a database of customers, and then you, you load it, and then we will automatically check if email is spammy, you know, we will pick up the, uh, the top K of email domains, um, and, and for phone numbers, we will verify if it's a valid phone number and so forth. Um, so things like that. And it's, it's it's quite extensible, so anyone who would, who would use it can add their own transformers. And that was also the idea of how to build it. So actually, how, how can we build a bunch of transformations to include into the library and make it easily extensible so other teams in Salesforce or around the world can now come over and contribute it. And we, we pretty much leverage a bunch of Spark abstractions of um, transformers and estimators. Um, we just kind of put a little bit of more fine-grained typing on it to, to provide better type safety. Behind the scene, we, we collect a bunch of metadata. So when, when, you, when you apply any reader or raw feature filter or safety check or anything, any part of the, of the library, a bunch of metadata is computed against the data. And we use this metadata to deduct some of the uh, decisions that stages do, but also we keep it so users can actually inspect it and and get better understanding of what their data looks like. Um, so it's, uh, it, it actually also serves us for the prediction insights and the model insights that are accessible to the library. And this is very important to give um, better visibility on what 
actually the, the model itself, model itself does. Um, so going to the next section is the automate, automatic feature selection, and this is where you know hardcore stats uh, folks will, will, will smile uh, and you know yay like clap and stuff. Uh, is, is that actually that's the part where we go ahead and we you know we read the papers and we put an important statistics such as you know previous V and um, mutual information computations that we do against the label and we keep it also right. So it's it's, it's one of the things that we we collect uh, as we go. So another problem I want to touch is um, the automatic, automatic feature selection. Uh, is that when when we compute those statistics now, we need to actually have to decide is this feature a leaker. So this is one of the problems actually with label leakage. Uh, label leakage is uh, is one of the issues that happens a lot in tabular and structured data. Is where I give an example. So for example, we have a you know. A table of leads, right? So Salesforce have a, a tables of leads where people would, would put the information about their customers and they would call them. And if customers reply and ready to sign a contract, they might put in a, a number of the estimated contract value before they actually convert the lead to account or opportunity. So this is what leaker is. So the when when some of your data correlates exactly with a label. Right, so we already have the account value. So this feature should be the account value should be excluded when we build machine application because it actually is so predictive it will spoil your model. Um, and uh, this is how it looks like from a developer perspective. So the users really write one line of code to say, okay, go send you check my features, and here's the feature vector. And I want you to compute this, uh, you know, the personal correlation or whatever other correlation you want. And then we, we compute it and we print it out so users can, well, you can barely see it, but we bring around the, the problematic features. The last step is the model selection. So if you would go and do it, say, for example, in Spark, uh, Spark, um, you will have to apply model by model and run like a, some libraries that do it for Python, for example, like Pcode. <coughs> and uh, Alpha Skyler, um, Security, they, uh, but this is pretty much what they do. They, you want to do uh, some kind of smart search through the through your model space plus the hyperparameters, and then find some maxima that matches the data set and spit it out. So this is what we also wanted to, to provide. And from the again, from the user's perspective, it looks quite simple. So you can pick. Families of models, so okay, I want a linear regression and random forest regressor. Um, you would specify a grid. I just specified here this couple prompts, but this grid can be very large. I can imagine XGBoost. So XGBoost has hundreds of parameters. Um, you definitely don't want to do it manually, so you want to feed it into the, cell, into the model selector and let the, the Spark to, to take care of this. Um, and then this, well, I had to remove the, the, the y-axis here and the x-axis was pretty much cleaned up. But uh, when we do just logistic regression, it might look like this, right? You, you tried a couple parameters, or maybe some more. But if you try multiple, multiple families of algorithms, your models can improve significantly. And this is, again, transparent to, to the users. And and there is no good demo, uh, sorry, there is no good presentation without a demo. So yeah. here's a demo for you. I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do a short demo now. Let's see if we can, okay. I'll probably need to exit the end show on this. So in this demo, I'm gonna run uh, a pretty popular machine learning application. It's, uh, it's predicting survivors on Titanic. You know, there's like a pretty known but morbid data set of all the all the Titanic passengers, and we have a label on each one of them if this person survived or not. And now, let's just see if I can see it that fast. Um, So it's a it's like a classical binary classification problem when we want to classify by survived or not. 
we have our training set. This is the again one table set of uh, set of passengers. Let's start. Oh, this is so weird. My cursor doesn't move. This is so weird. Yeah, I can only move up to here. Okay. How long is it gonna take? Uh, well, I'll make it very quick. Okay. I'll start, I'll work really fast and make it really quick. <coughs> yeah. Well, we started late, but I, I know. Good yeah. point. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Um, so let's look on. Okay. So this is. Uh, okay. Um, can you see this? I don't know. Should I should I zoom out? Yeah. Zoom out. Yeah. Make it bigger. Uh, I, I, my mouse doesn't move left, sorry, I cannot, I don't remember that book either. So we'll have to settle with this. So I went ahead and I defined a little case class in Scala. So just imagine this is your Java quadruple class or whatever. That holds the information about the passenger, it has ID, and a bunch of other fields, like a passenger class. Uh, and name and, you know, what's the, what's the gender, it's the sex, age, sibling, and spouses. If you look into Kaggle, this is exactly like the standard data in data set. Um, and then what I do here, I, I read the data set. You know, data reader is a simple CSV case class reader. This is like one of the data reads we have. Um, then I, I, I materialize the features directly from the, from the data. So feature definitions are, you know, I'm not even creating them. And then I call the transmogram by shortcut. So this is a fully automated, Autopilot machine learning, uh, very much vanilla run. And then I want to send you check the, the data and run some binary classification model on this with some completely fully default grid. Now let's see, um, let's see, yeah, I'll probably this one. So I'm going to run, run it on my uh, local machine. It takes around 40 seconds, so maybe like a minute to run. This is going to run Spark in a local mode. And at the end, it will print out the, the model summary for this model. And by default, what it's doing, it runs like logistic regression random forest with a three-fold cross-validation um, and, uh, and other, other stuff. Let's see. Oh, like four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I will, I will wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah, reasonable. Good. Uh, Since it's running, I have question quick. Uh, questions after the presentation. All right, Sorry. okay. All right. Uh, well, you want to explain what, what the demo will be? To I actually removed all the printouts, so it will be actually like fast and clean, but <coughs> it, oh, okay. it takes more time. I don't know why. Well, okay. I, don't I understand. I actually want to get to the summary, uh, go to the summary a little bit. Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. So, what this spit out is like a little summary. Uh, again, it's a, it's a, you know, executive summary we call it. It's a very short summary of what, what the model. Okay, so selected. Well, it shows like okay, I ran random forest for this regression, and uh, you know, use a cross validation with an area under PR metric, and this is the range of my models was, and uh, the selected model of random forest. So. Area under PR is 0.79, that's not great, right? And you kind of, okay, well, let's see. Well, at least you can see the again, area under PR. Error is almost 40%. Uh, this is a bad model, right? It's like out of the box, Titanic doesn't really work, work because there is, first of all, there's a label extension there, but there are other things. Um, but you also can see some of the uh, good features that you want to concentrate on. And then, a developer can go back here and then uh, build something like this. So take the same thing, but now manually go and define the features and manually do the uh, do the feature selection. And again, this code is not much different from what was before, but some extra lines of code, and then run the same model selection. So let's see if I have. Uh, Yeah, this, this should be quicker, I think, because this one has less models. Um, so, and this, this gets us to probably 0 0.94, 95, something like this. Um, and this didn't took me a long time, so I just literally like 
start from a prototype and then hack next time. Uh, I need to, I, I hope you finished the, the last two slides here. Okay, so how long does it work? It works great. This is the real thing. Go Google for us. We serve more than 3 billion predictions on this library. Mm. And this is Mark Binio's tweet about this library. I'm pretty proud about it myself. Um, so, um, and models are hands-free, so we don't, we don't really babysit the models, we don't train them. We auto-generate and deploy them, and they serve our customers. So your takeaways, you know, go define your appropriate level of abstraction, use types, try to automate uh, your processes. And if you're interested in the library, Here's the, here's the URL, go check it out. It's on GitHub, fully open source, it's in production, and 100% Scala around on top of the Spark. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Matthew. Very good, excellent. Good presentation, except that you know, we want to make sure they, they start. Uh, no questions. Because Any questions or no questions outside? Okay. Meet me outside. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very important slide. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Excellent. While the other gentleman, go ahead.